Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third annual Social Emotional Learning Summit and our very first online event. We are so excited to be with you. My name is Carla Tantillo Filibert. I'm the founder of Mindful Practices and the co founder of the SEL Check In Platform Class Catalyst. And with me is Ryan Nevis, Illinois ASCD. Glad to be here for the third year. I'm not sure how it's already the third year, but but here we are. Here we are, Carla. I know, I know. And we are so thrilled to have each of you with us, especially during this challenging time. We so appreciate your, your coming together to build community and your support. I also want to give a huge thanks, and I know Ryan does as well, to Rob and Mary, Vienna, all our tech folks behind the scenes that are making this happen. Y'all are rock stars. Um, you know, we're figuring it out as we go here for this huge event and we so appreciate their support and your patience. So as we all continue to grapple with the uncertainty surrounding 2020 in the fall and schooling, I'd like us to start with just a little centering breath to bring us together and to pause for a moment and check in. And so let's do that folks. Let's scoosh to the edge of our seats. Let's roll our shoulders back a few times. Let's roll our shoulders forward a few times and sit up tall. A little trick that I love to check in is I place a hand on my belly and a hand on my collarbones. And as I breathe, I fill that hand on the belly with breath. And then I also can feel that collarbone hand rise. Let's take a few breaths here together just checking in and noticing what we're bringing into the day. Do we have questions? Are we here to engage in critical conversation? Are we here to share? What brings us together today? What brings you here? Taking one more deep breath on your own. Beautiful. And then when you're ready, giving it a big shake out. Shake, 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 shake. Awesome. Awesome. So um, a few things I'm going to share about the summit and our thoughts and intentionality behind it. And then I'm going to turn it over to Ryan. He is going to go through the fabulous housekeeping and logistical piece. And then we're going to turn it over to our fabulous keynote speaker, Mr. Dwayne Reed. Woo, woo, CPS represents. I'm so excited. And so, and so we are friends here at the forefront of this unique opportunity in education. We have this chance to reflect back on school as we knew it before and think, how can we do it? better. We hope that your learning during this conference provides clarity, provides support, and perhaps some new perspectives. But let us say that we are learners right alongside you. And we've encouraged our speakers to say, hey, no one has the answers because no one's, no one's gone through a pandemic before, not in our lifetime. And so we're here to be thought partners together. We're here to share resources together. We're here to be learners together. And that's the hat that we're wearing as we present this, this platform for sharing. We present this platform for us all to come together in community, have some difficult conversations, have some critical conversations, speak our fears together. One of the things that I, again, wanna bring our attention to is this thought around how can we be curious about this change? How can we be curious about reimagining the shift, the shift from traditional ways of teaching to, to leading and learning in a different way, a way that is more anti-racist, more equitable, and more empowering, more resilient in this educational space. That's what we were thinking about as we were planning the summit, and that's what we hope you get from this summit. We really want this time and our schools in the fall to be one that's focused on student and educator voice. All the caring adults in a school building, classified, non-classified staff, custodial staff, clerks, everyone that takes care of kids, you all matter and your voices need to be heard. In social emotional learning, historically what we've done 
is we've kind of been adults that say, all right, it looks like this kid might need this solution. And we haven't paused to actually ask the students what they need. And we're hoping that's another takeaway from the event that we learn how to capture authentically student voice, how to listen to students more. So everyone has a seat at the table, inclusive of families, inclusive of all stakeholders. As Maya Angelou said, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. And friends, Ryan and I and our teams and the speakers believe that this is our moment together. This is our moment to create better schools and classrooms, classrooms that care about students, classrooms that care about teachers. This is our moment, friends, to step into action. Now, we can't begin these challenges, challenges and these conversations without acknowledging these times. Many of you have faced difficulty, uncertainty, grief, and loss during this challenging time. And we invite you now to be with us and to share that grief, to share that loss, to share that uncertainty and anxiety. This is a safe space. We hope to do that. We have strive to create that because it's really important that as we look forward, we also take a moment to reflect on what we have been through, both individually and collectively. We are deeply, deeply grateful and welcome any feelings you might have. And so Ryan and I are here for you. Email us, you've got our email addresses, they're in the welcome email. If there's something that isn't resonating, if there's something that you have questions, know that we're here arm in arm with you to engage in these critical conversations. It's really important to us, to the speakers, to the summit coordinating committee, that everyone here is a learner and that we're on this journey together. There are no experts during a pandemic. No one's done this before. So again, we're here to share with you. We're here to answer questions. We're here to be a thought partner. We're deeply, deeply grateful to you for sharing these two days with us. On behalf of myself, Mindful Practices team, and Illinois ASCD and their amazing folks. Thank you, thank you, folks, friends, for being here. It's gonna be an amazing two days. Ryan, over to you, my friend. Carla, so well said, as always. Um, you know, this year is remarkable. And, you know, I just gotta kind of give you a little sneak peek from what's happening behind the scenes. About March, obviously, all of our lives changed. And we really blew this conference up and completely reimagined it. So what you're gonna see on this jam-packed schedule over the next two days is timely, relevant content that you can use today, not only for the pandemic, but a lot of the social issues that we have going on. Um, you know, with all due respect to the past two year summits, I think this is the best year we've ever offered. So we are so excited to have all of you here. Obviously it looks a little different. Here we all are in our living rooms, our offices, um, but, you know, in all situations, I try to find the silver lining, be optimistic. Let's look at the bright side. We're learning together in the comfort and safety of our homes, our offices, surrounded by loved ones, colleagues, friends, pets. Um, and that's pretty unique for, for our industry. You know, usually we're, we're pulled away from home. We're in our buildings. We're in our classrooms. You know, if you're on um, the, the PD side of things, you're on a plane windshield time, lumpy hotel beds. Um, so let's just be grateful that we're all, we're all safe uh, and, and supported here uh, today. It also makes things with the digital platform a little bit easier logistically for you, our guests. Uh, and I just really wanna hone in on just a couple key points. Again, this is all review. All this information can be, um, can be read through and, and referenced in your welcome letter that you probably have had four or five times at this point, and you should expect to see another two or three times before the uh, end of the day tomorrow. But key takeaways, number one, if you take anything away or remember anything that I'm about to say is, let your schedule be your guide. I would suggest bookmarking this or keeping it up in a separate window. It's gonna easily allow you to navigate between those five minute passing periods in between breakouts. You know, you'll have your title, session details, and most important, your session link. Um, this also is going to allow you to, uh, if the worst case scenario happens and you get disconnected for, for whatever reason, you can go back into the schedule, hit that original link, and boom, you are seamlessly back into the presentation uh, without missing a beat. Number two, 
Uh, as Carla mentioned, you know, while our staff isn't roaming the hallways uh, looking to help you, know that we are behind the scenes. We have um, staff members from Illinois ASCD from Mindful Practices scheduled in every breakout session. We'll be doing introductions. So we're there as your behind the scenes facilitators. At any point in time, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to drop them into the chat box and we can respond to you um, in, in a timely fashion. What we've also done is in this chat box, I've dropped a handful of, of emails for our staff, uh, depending on your problem. You can reach out that way. And we just want you to feel supported, know that, uh, know that we are here for you. And the third and final thing, uh, because we're already getting the questions, uh, expect a thank you email at the end of the day. Please do not trash this one immediately. Read through it. <laughs> not that you would, not that you would. I just know how much email all of us get. I don't want it to get lost in the shuffle um, because that's going to have some important recaps from today. It's going to have announcements for tomorrow. You know, there's no major changes, but with a conference, that's always a possibility. Uh, and most important, it's going to have your evaluation. You know, that's going to earn you your professional development credit hours. Also give us valuable feedback uh, that we can use to make this, uh, uh, you know, experience better for you in future years. You follow these simple steps, you sit back and relax, you are going to have a fantastic day. Carla, was there anything housekeeping wise that you would like to add? No, no, I just wanted to reiterate, like, thank you all for being here. We value you. We value your commitment to this engaging work. Thank you. It is going to be a wonderful two days, friends. Let's laugh. Let's cry. Let's share together. Thank you. It's going to be fabulous. Absolutely. Now we're moving into the part of the morning that I'm most excited about. Uh, and please allow me to fanboy out a little bit here. Um, <laughs> About two or three years ago, I went to an international conference, uh, with about 10 or 15 colleagues, um, a huge event, about 10,000 people at McCormick Place. Um, we were walking into a keynote uh, by Ron Clark. If you don't know Ron, he's award-winning, innovative educator, has a remarkable school down in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, as a presenter, he is charismatic, and to say high energy would probably not be doing him justice. Uh, and his opening act was a gentleman named Dwayne Reed. So Dwayne comes on stage, does his 30 to 40 minutes, and we are blown away. My group, number one, we look at each other, pick our jaws up off the ground and say, what, who was that guy? Um, we've been trying to work with him ever since. And, and really, I'm not just saying this, you know, the buzz around the conference was Dwayne stole the show. He honestly did. He just... It's baseball season, finally. He hit a home run, a grand slam. If you don't know Dwayne, you know, he is a teaching phenomenon, uh, really an education activist, as Carla mentioned, CPS teacher. Uh, really, he's been crisscrossing the entire globe, promoting his message of love and equity in education. You may know him from his viral success, um, his music video, Welcome to the Fourth Grade. Um, you could have seen him on Good Morning America. CNN, and this is going to bring some of you back, MTV's TRL. I'm not sure who's with me there. <laughs> uh, Mr. Reed has been on a mission to convince the world that relationships uh, mean everything in education. Every child, no matter their race or social status, deserves a fair chance at a quality education. Uh, when he does have some free time, he enjoys writing, playing a little basketball, just chilling and hanging around his neighborhood in the west side of Chicago. Please give a warm SEL welcome for Mr. Dwayne Reed. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ryan. Yeah, taking us all back with that uh, MTV Terra. You know, I'm, I'm getting up there in age too, so it's not just everyone else. Um, thank you for having me. It is a pleasure. Um, let me go ahead and get situated. Um, and as with everyone else, if I if I find myself with some technical difficulties, I'm sure everyone will hopefully show me some grace. Um, but I'm gonna pull up my screen and we'll get this party started. Um, Rob, would I be able to share screen?
Rob, do you hear me? Ryan, did you check on that? Can you hear me? If I'm looking to share screen? Yes, yeah, I'm uh, checking on it right now, Dwayne. Okay. Thanks, Dwayne. We're figuring we're figuring it out. We've got two streams going. We got YouTube and Zoom, so it'll just be one sec, my friend. Oh, cool! Absolutely. Now I know I'm probably not allowed to ask you to sing the song, or is the song part of your present? Because I looked, I saw the video, and I loved it, and I was like, oh, I hope he'll sing the song. Um, yeah, I can definitely sing a song for you all today, for sure. Yeah, that was, um, Ryan has been singing your praises, my friend. He, when he says fanboy, I think he had a shirt made that actually has you, your face on it, um, that he wears around the house. I'm going to have to call his wife and verify, but I'm pretty sure, Ryan, you have, you've made a shirt of Dwayne, haven't you? Cause you, you are like, understandably. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wouldn't be the first time, um, a woman actually, made a dress and it has my face on it. Um, and I took screenshots of it. It is either the creepiest or weirdest thing that I've ever experienced in my life. But um, if, if I'm unable to do the share screen, then that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, okay, let me check. Actually, no, I'm good to go now, great. Awesome, great. Perfect. Thanks yeah. for your patience. Yeah, thank you, you guys. Again, as, an, as a teacher, as an educator, we know this is run of the mill, right? Get you guys out of the way. All right, everything looks good. Good to go. Hello, I'm your teacher. My name's Mr. Reed, and it's very blessed to meet you. I'm from Chicago. I love eating pizza, and I dress to impress, but I still rock sneakers. It's my fourth year teaching, so it's all real exciting. Got some ideas, and I really like to try them. Like making songs to remember what you hear. You'll be learning so much by the end of the year. To my friends, my peers, the parents, and the students, I'm ready, you're ready, we're ready, let's do this, yeah. But absolutely no day dreaming, working hard till the bell starts ringing. Welcome to the fourth grade. Hey, so happy to meet you. Hey, can't wait till I see you. Hey, we're gonna have a good time. Yeah. Welcome to the fourth grade. Ooh, praise from all across Chicago, praise. As stated, my name is Dwayne Reed, and I'm from the great city of Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I've been working in education since 2012 during the first Chicago public school teacher strike way back when. The teachers weren't getting what they deserved or needed, and as a result, neither were the kids. So the day the strike began, I started volunteering at an after-school program that housed, fed, tutored, and cared for students who were displaced at the time. From there, I went to a two-year community college in downtown Chicago, then transferred to Eastern Illinois University, Go Blue, which is located pretty much in the middle of Nowheresville, Illinois. <laughs> and finally, I secured my bachelor's degree in elementary education with two middle school endorsements. In the fall of 2016, my life changed forever. Right before my student teaching tenure began, I wrote the rap lyrics you just heard me perform while sitting on my grandma's bed. Hey, grandma. And right after I penned those words, an associate of mine agreed to film my very first music video. Hey, video guy. And not seven hours after we published that video to his YouTube account, we went viral. Hey, millions of people across the entire world. I have no idea why we went viral. Maybe it's because kids could see a teacher who they desperately wanted to know would see them. Maybe it's because parents heard a teacher who they felt would listen to them. Or maybe, just maybe, it's because educators just like y'all saw a glimpse of yourselves in me. No, not a ridiculously handsome black man, <laughs> but a teacher who was dedicated to capturing the hearts of their kids. Maybe that's why it went viral. I don't know. No one really knows. Just like no one knows why Kim Kardashian is as famous as she is. Wait a minute. We know exactly why Kim Kardashian is as famous as she is. But we're not going to talk about that right now. So thankfully, y'all can check out this clean video and decide what's what for yourselves. Let's check it out. 
My name's Mr. Reed, and it's very nice to meet ya. I'm from Chicago, I love eating pizza, and I dress to impress, but I still rock sneakers. It's my first year teaching, so it's all real exciting. Got some ideas, and I really like to try them. Like making songs to remember what you hear. We'll be learning so much by the end of the year. To my friends and my peers, the parents and the students, I'm ready, you're ready, we're ready, let's do this. Yeah, but absolutely no daydreaming. And working hard till the bell starts ringing. Welcome to the fourth grade. So happy to meet you. Meet you. Can't wait till I see you. We're gonna have a good time. Yeah. We'll study mathematics, division and adding. And don't forget fractions. Fractions. We're gonna have a good time. Yeah. Welcome to the fourth grade. I'll always greet you with a smile. I'll always try to make the lessons worthwhile. <laughs> and when you do good work, I'll acknowledge because I know that you're headed off to work or to college. So we got to keep it positive. That's the key. Have respect for each other and don't forgive me. Have respect for yourselves and the staff and the school. Having fun can be cool when we're following the rules. Nah, nah. Time's gonna fly. fly. Before you know it, you'll be moving in the grade five. But for now, we'll be working and the learning and the singing all the way till the bell starts ringing. Welcome to the fourth grade. So happy to meet you. Meet you. Can't wait till I see you. We're gonna have a good time. Yeah. We'll learn about English, English. Write papers and read them. A plus and you'll see them. Them. We're gonna have a good time. Yeah. Welcome to the fourth grade. Hey. Go, go, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I didn't write that song to go viral. Uh, I didn't write it in hopes of becoming edu famous or speaking all over the place and being well known in education. I wrote that song to connect with my scholars. The most important thing I wanted them to know about me was that it was my goal to be the educator they needed. And that's my challenge to you all today. Despite everything that's going on, COVID-19, school reopening or not reopening, the pandemic of racism, the epidemic of racism that has gone on for centuries, despite all of that, will you choose to do what it takes to be the educator your scholars need? The first thing that I need you to do um, in light of that is to um, tweet me or Instagram me while we're going through the session. You can find me at Teach Mr. Reed. Make sure you use the hashtag Maslow before Bloom or relationships matter. So make sure you follow me at Teach Mr. Reed and tweet me throughout the session, please and thank you. And make sure you get my good side if you're taking uh, any screenshots. In education, relationships matter most. They are at the center of you being the educator that your scholars need and are the foundation of a successful classroom or school environment. It's this idea that we have to Maslow before they can bloom. I like that. Someone should put it on a shirt. I think Ryan already put it on a shirt. Um, we have to Maslow before they can bloom, which means we have to meet the kids' basic needs before anything else worthwhile can take place. Maslow before bloom means that we must care for their heart before trying to get anything through to their head. In other words, a relationship with your kids is the most essential aspect of your educational career. Hashtag relationships matter. Now you might ask, Mr. Reed, where does this relationship start, right? And to that, I say it starts by answering the question of, who am I? Every successful relationship starts with one person revealing themselves to the other or vice versa. It's why I created the Welcome to the Fourth Grade music video so that my kids can know from jump the craziness they were getting themselves into. 
it's why God will say to his people, I will reveal myself to you and you will know me. The revelation of who you are to someone begins your relationship with them. Does anybody remember those old school television dating shows from the 70s and the, the 80s? Well, let's talk about them. Those shows were crazy. They were wild. They were corny. And as a millennial, I only know about them because of YouTube. Well, SEL Summit, let's play one. Welcome to the dating game. I'm your host, Bob Johnson. On today's episode, we've got three fine contestants vying for your love. Let's hear about them right now. Bachelor behind door number one, please tell us about yourself. My name is uh, D Smooth. <laughs> Man. They say I'm a ladies man, but for you, sweetheart, yes, you, sweetheart, I'll be a gentleman. <laughs> now hurry up and write down your number before I don't want it no more. Thank you, Bachelor Behind Door number one. Bachelor Behind Door number two, tell us about yourself, please. <sighs> My name is D. People say I'm lazy and unmotivated. I just don't have the time to argue with them. Uh, I've been in between jobs for about the last three years. Um, I have one roommate who gets on my last nerve, but I, I, I can't really complain because they also pay the bills. Also, her name is mom. <laughs> so thank you, Bachelor Behind Door Number Two, Slim Pickings Today, Chicago. Bachelor Behind Door Number Three, please tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is Mr. Reed. Um, I'm my best self whenever I'm around kids. I'm passionate about equitable education for all, and I do what it takes to make learning fun again. And I'm a hopeful romantic. Oh, ladies, isn't he something sweet? So the choice is now yours. I want to see it in the chat box. Are you going to select bachelor number one, bachelor number two, or bachelor number three? Go ahead and put your answers in there. Bachelor one, two, or three. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Get that chat going. Okay, okay, okay. Some people are saying number one. All right, you're looking for a good time tonight. Hey, I'm a married man, watch out. <laughs> so while your students aren't deciding whether or not they want to date you, they are deciding if they wanna engage in a meaningful school place relationship with you. But just like in the dating game, guess what their decision is based on? What you choose to reveal about yourself. How will you answer the question of who am I to your kids? I answer it by telling my students as much as I possibly can about myself. This so that they can find something to connect with and latch onto. For example, my boys know that I play basketball and I'm generally into sports. NBA starts tomorrow. I'm generally into sports. My girls like that I know about their different hairstyles and the types and the, the, how, how it's put together. And I keep up with some of the famous singers and entertainers that they're super into. Even as we practice distance learning or virtual learning, a way to grow in that is, man, maybe you need to hop on TikTok. Maybe you need to hop on Instagram and post about yourself. Your kids will love that. How can you reveal who you are to them? As an educator, one of the easiest things you can do to foster a positive relationship with your scholars is talk about yourself. What draws them to you? For example, some of y'all were drawn to bachelor number one because you haven't had a good time in a long time. And right now sounds like the right time. Amen, amen. Um, one of the foundations of Maslow Before Bloom is talking about you. Talk about your background, interests, hobbies, family, dreams, marital status. Just about everything outside of what you would confess to a Catholic priest is pretty much fair game as long as A, you're comfortable sharing it, and B, it's workplace appropriate. Take, for example, my singleness. Is you single, go online to go find you a loved one. At, at one point in my life, I wasn't married. I know, crazy. But last year, one of my students said to me, Mr. Reed, you need you a girl. And I said, I do. Do you know of any girls that I should hit up? Immediately, and I mean immediately. She looked at me with the most funkiest of faces, like I was the ugliest dude in the world. And she said, uh, absolutely not. I would never hook you up with anybody I know, Mr. Reed. And I walked away with my head down, knowing I was going to be single for the rest of my life. But you know what? Seven months ago, that same student was at my wedding asking her mama if she could stay longer because she was having so much fun. Guess I'm not that ugly after all, am I? The bottom line is this, great educators must, must answer the question of who am I so that their kids can get to know you and like you as a person. Kids will do anything for the adults that they like, anything. 
If you tell them nothing, they'll like nothing. But if you tell them everything, I promise you, they'll find something they can like about you. Something, I promise. And the more they like you, the more they're willing to listen to you. Amen? If I was in an in, in-person in conference, I'd say amen, and I'd expect everyone to retort amen, you know, like we do in a black church. So amen, amen. Um, do I have any fans of the television show, The Bachelor or The Bachelorette? Well, as you know, as these season, uh, as these shows progress, the season progresses, you begin to learn more and more about each contestant. You develop a, a certain fascination with the different people. Oh, she looks like me, man, he's funny like I am. He's probably going to win. Wow, if I could just get a rose. I see some people raising their hands and raising their glass of wine. I see you out there. Um, you begin to connect with these contestants based on what you know about them. This is why when your favorite person doesn't receive a rose, it breaks your heart into a million pieces. You cry, no, it should have been them. You've grown to love them because of what they've shared about themselves. You think they're worth the rose. One day I had to go to a dentist, so I needed a substitute for my class. My kids behaved great and I got nothing but a good report from the guest teacher. However, the next day, one of my scholars, Ye Ye, pulls me to the side before class and says, Mr. Reed, you better not never leave us with no white man ever again. Now, what Ye Ye was truly saying was, Mr. Reed, I missed you. You should have been the one that was here, not him. You are worth the robes. Educators, I ask you, is your classroom worth the robes? Is your school building worth the rose, have you told the people around you enough about you that if you're gone for one day, they'll cry, no, they should have been here. What have you given them to latch onto, to love and to remember forever? Last year, one of my fifth graders messaged me and said, Mr. Reed, I just heard one of the Chance the Rapper songs you used to play all the time during class and it made me think of you, I miss you. SEL Summit, I ask you, what will your scholars miss you for? Being the educator you need, you need it and they need means answering the question of who am I? So here's a quick look of that. Maslow before bloom means reaching their heart before their head. The most important thing in education is not academic, it's the relationships matter. A meaningful and authentic relationship with your kids starts by telling them meaningful things about yourself. And finally, make every day worth the rose. The first piece that goes into being the educator that your scholars need is answering the question of who am I? The next piece that goes into it is answering the question of who are they? Who are your students? And not just their first and last names, you know, not just the clothes that they wear, but at a deeper level, who are they? Maslow before Bloom says that if you get to know them, they'll want to know what you're trying to teach them. While your students are learning math, in reading and how to navigate through their annoying little dog that keeps bothering them during their virtual learning, you should be learning about them and the best ways to love and teach them. This starts by asking questions. What is their story? What are their interests? What things excite or frustrate them? Who do they live with? That's especially important, important now in the age of virtual learning. Who do they live with? What's their home, -like, home life look like? What do they want to be when they grow up? I had a student tell me that her life goal was to grow up and work at the mall. Totally fine, honest living. But I challenged her throughout the year and exposed her to what I considered grander opportunities worth pursuing. By the end of the school year, that same student said she wanted to design new malls and all the stores that would be placed inside of them. She wanted to get into architecture. That happened only because she revealed who she was to me and I cared about it. I cared enough to ask questions about her. We must ask our scholars personal, personal questions. One question worth asking is, what do your students think you think about them? Uh, a few months into the school year, I wrote this question on the board. What does Mr. Reed think about me? Then I had my scholars write their answers to these questions on a sheet of paper and privately share them with me. <laughs> the results were all over the place. Some were really silly, some made me say, hmm, some hurt my heart, and most of all, they showed me that I needed to do a better job of getting to know who each individual scholar was. One girl said to me, Mr. Reed thinks I'm smart and I'm funny, but that sometimes I could be irritating. I laughed, and then I gave her some written feedback, which said, yep. <laughs> 
But once that scholar told me that she thought, I thought she was irritating, I went out of my way to communicate to her that I really enjoyed her presence, despite some of the little tics that she might've had. I even named her little Oprah because you know she 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 kind of talked a lot. And at the beginning of each new week, I would give her five minutes to give the class an update of the events that took place over the weekend. The bottom line is this: I took the information that she gave me about herself and we grew from it. Great educators know that compiling data about their kids is worthless if they don't use it for their benefit. So to me, Here's what data should stand for. Data should always turn into application. I'm gonna say that again. Data should always turn into application. The treasured information we discover about our scholars must be used to further the relationships we have with them. One super easy way to do this is to make frequent references to the things that you know they like during instruction. For example, like everyone's kids in the galaxy, my kids love to play Fortnite. It's all they talk about all the time. And they eat, I even do the little dances that they do on the game sometimes during instruction. It's an instant wake up tool and a connective piece of our day. Or if I feel things are getting a little dull, I'll randomly bust out singing one of the more popular tunes on the radio or one I've written and shared with my class. For example, I might play something like this. I'm gonna learn how to learn today and I won't be bothered by mistakes from yesterday. Tell my parents and my teacher too. Today I'm gonna learn about something new. My kids love hearing that song be played or randomly gets them out of their seats and we're ready to go. And finally, when considering the question of who are they, something worth noting is this. What are the kinds of things your students are dealing with at home? What is impacting them outside of the classroom which might be spilling into the classroom. I read a book called There Are No Children Here by Alex Kotlowitz, which chronicled the lives of two boys in Chicago during the late 80s and early 90s. Though it wasn't specifically written about my scholars, it was written about my scholars. This is the same city with the same kids and some of the same situations just 30 years later. That book, along with Jonathan Kozel's Savage Inequalities, helped shape my perspective on some of the things that almost all of our kids have experienced. Things like, Things like abandonment by their parents, molestation, physical and verbal abuse, parents addicted to drugs, foster care woes, being shot at, actually being shot, losing family and friends to gun violence, gang affiliations within the school or food insecurity. Being aware of some of the mess that takes place in our kids' lives will help us love them through some of the mess that they bring into the classroom. And if you think they're not bringing mess into the classroom, you ain't been in the classroom long enough. We all have these problems and issues that we have to deal with. This ain't just a Chicago thing. This ain't just an urban thing. It's a life thing. But Maslow before Bloom means knowing your students well enough to know exactly how they need to be loved. Being the educator you needed means answering the question of who are they? The way to do this is ask personal questions about your, get in, get in a life. What you doing? What's your life like? Make reference to the things that you know your kids like. Stop and share stories with one another or songs or jokes and find out what home life is like and respond accordingly. Like I said, that is especially important, important now during this, this, this age of remote learning, finding out what home life is like because you are going to be, for the most of us, teaching and figuring out how to navigate through their home life environment. So as I'm, as I'm nearing the end, we move into the last piece of the puzzle in being the educator that your scholars need. You must answer the question of who am I first, who are they, and finally, who are we? As a whole, as a collective, as a unit, what does our makeup look like? Educators must intentionally make the shift away from me versus them to we. But going from me to we ain't as easy as can be. But the difference between a good teacher and a great teacher is intentionality. If you can, go ahead and type in the chat box the word intentionality. Go ahead and use that spell check too if you're not too familiar with how to spell it. But go ahead and type the word intentionality. 
You don't just end up with a positive classroom or school environment, thank you, on accident. It's always due to the connections and the relationships that educators work hard to create. Let me tell you a little story about intentionality. So it's my, my anniversary, let's assume. And I tell my, I, I forget. And I'm like, oh shoot, it's my wife's anniversary. I go to Chipotle because I know she likes Chipotle. I'm gonna get her the, the steak bowl, burrito bowl, and I'm gonna get the extra guacamole with the sour cream because I know she loves that black beans on the side. And I'm gonna even spring and get her an extra large Sprite because I know she likes the Sprite. If I go and I give that to her and I say, hey babe, happy anniversary. She gonna snatch that food up. She gonna run it to the room. She gonna shut the door and that's gonna be that. However, if I plan for weeks, what our anniversary is gonna look like. And I, I get her hair done, her nails done, her, no, nah, scratch that. I get her hair did, her nails did, I get everything did. I make sure she got a fly fit. I take her to Michael Jordan Steakhouse. I guarantee when we go home later that night, she is going to be very intentional with me. Again, let me hear y'all say intentionality, intentionality. That's what we want in our classrooms. Well, not the, you know what I'm saying? But we need that intentionality. Um, so the question you're probably thinking is, Mr. Reed, how do I accomplish this intentionality? You need to create this culture of we in your classroom, us togetherness. How do I accomplish this? Some quick and easy ways to do that. Take a look at my students real quick. Notice their faces, even the boys on the side who wanna be extra hard. Five minutes before this picture were taken, man, Mr. Reed, thank you for doing all this, taking us downtown, getting us McDonald's. The moment that picture's taken, they want to be stone cold, you know, kill us like, nah, man, that ain't y'all. We're family. We're family, and they know that. So how do I develop that in my classroom, Mr. Reed? One of the easiest ways is by greeting your students at the door. There's nothing better than a warm, smiling, greeting face, bright and early in the morning, especially if you've woken up on the wrong side of the bed. Many kids go through hell before they even step foot in your classroom. So the quickest way to act as a buffer and catch all that mess before it gets into your room and funks up your day is to greet your kiddos at the door. Another good way to, to cultivate this culture of we is for your classroom to play. Kids are kids. Play with them. Play games. Incorporate fun into the school day. Kids are mad competitive. We should be as educators as well, even the high schoolers. Take recess or gym to connect with your kids. Shoot some hoops. Challenge the fastest kid to a race. I, I am 151 and 0 when it comes to playing Connect Four. Like show them what it looks like for the world to crush them when it comes to competition sometimes. Play with your kids. Um, so I bought my girls a jump rope so that they could double dutch during recess because they didn't have anything. And it'd been years since I had jumped rope and I, I joked and told them I used to be a beast. And they were like, yeah, no, nah, Mr. Reed, that ain't you. And I said, yeah, that's me. You know, a little trash talk to keep things interesting. After a few weeks, I decided to show off my skills and, well, let me let you take a look. I will let you know this, this video is flipped to the side, so you're gonna have to turn your head a little bit when you watch it. Let's check it out. Okay, okay. Ended up jumping in perfectly and hopping up and down only for a few seconds, definitely not as good as I used to be, but they loved it. My fifth graders will never forget the teacher that literally jumped into their lives. Will you be that educator? So we greet each other whenever we meet, we play games together. And then one crucial tip, as far as answering the question of who are we, is for us to quit taking it personally. It's my special Q-tip. The number one way to make things more about we is to take the focus off of me. Stuff happens. Just because it happens to you doesn't necessarily mean it's about you. As a teacher, you can expect to get attacked often. Hopefully not physically, but it'll defi definitely happen to you verbally. Even now we're experiencing a barrage of attacks from officials and members of the community as we're wanting to maintain our safety and our health. Uh, of course, over, over the course of a year, your students might lash out at you, but the reality is it's probably not about you. Quit taking it personally. I had a scholar, we were in our small groups and he wasn't doing any work. And I said, yo, what's good, bro? Let's, let's, let's chop this up. And he breaks his pencil and me, I don't do well with 
disrespect. Um, so I had a problem with that. Um, I sent everybody else off to recess and lunch and I held him back and I said, yo, what's good? Let's talk. Stone face, stone face for 10 minutes. I'm like, hey, we need to talk about this. What's going on? Finally, he breaks down and starts crying and he says verbatim, Mr. Reed, this ain't even about you. So here I am trying to figure out what tier I need to put him on as far as this discipline that we need to enact. And it's not even a problem whatsoever. I manufactured the problem in my head. In order to answer the question of who are we, we have to take the focus off of ourselves. Quit taking it personally. And here are a few more quick steps, quick tips that I think might be helpful for you to immediately use in the classroom. Sit with your students during lunch or free time. Like everything does not have to be academically motivated. Sit with them and eat it up. I'll eat their hot, their hot Cheetos or their Takis and I'll say, give me these, mm, taxes. And look, I've taught them about taxes. Um, plan a few go-to phrases that you say every single day with your kids. No, my teacher says that. No, I remember he used to say that every day. Apologize regularly to your students. We need to normalize apologizing to children. And then last, like I said, sing as loudly as possible and dance as crazily as possible. Your kids already think that you're lame. Embrace it, embrace the lameness. Um, now, as I know I'm coming up on my end, I'll have to scoop through a great deal of this, um, but I want to transition into something a little more serious. Um, the National Center for Education Statistics found that white students made up 49% uh, of the population of public school students. That means that over half of the population of students are students of color and that number is rapidly increasing, while 80% of their teachers are white. Now there's nothing wrong with this per se, but there are certainly implications of that that we can neither neglect nor deny. Um, here's just a little snippet of that. Being the educator that you needed means checking your biases at the door. It's a conscious choice to see past yourself and to love beyond your own personal beliefs. Now you might say, Mr. Reed, I don't have any biases or my teachers, we're, we're completely equitable. We know what we're doing. And to that, I call BS. We're all under this, this umbrella of white supremacy. And while we might not all be quote unquote racists, we all have to be actively working against white supremacy and racism. No one is at a place where they can say, okay, the work here is done. We all have to be actively anti-racist. Great educators must serve their students of color. Um, so recognizing our bias, and then here are some of the actionable strategies that we can employ. Now, again, this breaks down much deeper uh, over the course of another talk, but here are just some quick tips. Pay for workshops and PDs that expose bias, that reveal it to you so that you can attack it, kill it. Hire qualified people of color. Um, there is no reason that we shouldn't have inclusivity right now in every single system that we have. Hold your staff accountable. If somebody is out of line, put them in check. And that might even mean firing them or set the tone for your school. Like the leader is going to set the tone for the rest of the school. If your leader is no nonsense and anti-racist, the school is going to begin to look like that. And if not, you gotta cut some, some loose ends there. Um, admit to your own privilege and leverage it for others' benefit. Uh, I, I went to see Black Panther with my students when it came out. And for some reason, the, the theater was giving us a hard time but we decided, you know what? It's not that big of a deal. We'll just catch it on the weekend type thing. The kids can see it with their family, so on and so forth. But my co-teacher, who is a white woman, put her hair into a bun and she said, no, 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 no. And she used so many three, four, five, six letter curse words. My ears are still scalded from them. Had I have done that, it wouldn't have been Wakanda forever. It would have been free Mr. Reed. But because she has the privilege to do that, she leveraged her privilege for the benefit of us and her scholars. That's what we need to do, especially as white people, leveraging our privilege for the benefit of others. Um, request PD centered around race, culture, and equity. Check your colleagues if they're out of line and reflect, apologize, and move on. We're going to make mistakes. None of us are experts, not even me. None of us are experts. None of us have it down pat. We reflect. We apologize, we fix it, and we move on. Um, so a quick few more strategies. Moving into your neighborhood where you teach, if possible, um, or spending a lot of time there outside of school. Um, and then looking up microaggressions, please take the time to look up what a microaggression is and stop doing them. Um, again, so as I, as I land this plane, I want to communicate that 
Being the educator that your scholars need extends even outside of the classroom. That might look like visiting them at sports games and watching them play. Um, even if they ride the bench, you're there with the sign that says, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you're in the game or you're on the team. Um, going to their plays or their recitals, even if they are playing all those notes a little bogus. Um, their religious events, I actually went to a Catholic mass and for one of my students, with one of my students, and I've never sat and stood and knelt and sat and stood and knelt more in my entire life. And I, I just didn't get it. And why do we all have to drink from the same cup? Like I, I would have been the one at uh, the Last Supper, like, nah, Jesus, you got a Dixie cup that we can pour this into because I saw Judas and his lips. Anyways, um, so go to their religious events, even if you're not religious, and their birthday parties, last but not least. I got invited to a fifth grade birthday party and I went and I turned up and it was amazing. And we had nachos and cake and we danced to TikTok videos. Involve yourself in that. Maybe at the high school level, not so much because who knows what's really in that cup. But at the elementary level and the middle school level, go get involved in your students' lives. And I, that scholar, I never had a problem with because they knew, look, hey, your mama just made me this fresh batch of nachos. You do not want to be the person that makes me have to call her. So get involved in their lives outside of the school environment. Being the educator that you need and that your scholars need requires that you answer, ask and answer three questions. Who am I? Who are they? And who are we? And that will make for scholars that come back and say, you know, my teacher loves me. Thank you. Oh, Dwayne, that was so fabulous. Folks, let's give Dwayne a round, a huge round of applause. I feel like I have to clap, even though I know that, you know, but Dwayne, fabulous. And you know what I love is I love that you're giving us permission to be vulnerable and you're giving us permission to be lame. Um, Oh, right. <laughs> like, let me sing. Let me do some yoga poses in front of kids. Let me be a goof. It's like permission to be goofy. Dwayne, this was the perfect keynote to 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 have to set off, set the tone for the conference, to set us off on this journey from the bottom of my heart, from Ryan's and the team. And I, I know the participants as well. Thank you. Absolutely. It's a blast. I wish again. I, and this is just off off the cuff. I wish that all this COVID stuff wasn't happening, obviously. I wish that we did not have to experience this. Um, man, I wish that we could go back and make the school year as strong as it normally is. Um, but man, I see the importance, sorry about that, but I see the importance of... Um, yeah, You're blowing up. People are like, awesome keynote, man. They're like, they're loving it. Um, if you can disregard that as, hey, look, we're teachers. This happens all the time. So it oh, is. Right, right, um, right. And you know, we, we have to wrap anyway, sadly, because, um, but I just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so closing, closing word, my friend, because I know that there's so much to say. Yeah, closing word. We are going to get through this. Um, teachers have always been on the front line. So though we're not essential workers like doctors or um, nurses, we have always been essential workers. Um, don't forget that you're not just a teacher. Um, you are a life changer. And I don't mean that in some cliche way. I mean that in a matter of fact, you are a life changer, period way. Don't forget that. Um, even as we continue to work through these turbulent times, don't forget that. Thank you. Dwayne, thank you for this amazing gift of your time. Thank you so much. Um, participants now, when you're ready, find, find your schedule, click on the links. We're here to support you if you have any, you know, trouble. And thank you again to Dwayne. Take care, everyone. We'll see you in session soon at 10 o'clock.